Hey runners, just another running coach here with a guide on how to find the best running shoes for you and your training needs. If I could underline one word in that intro, it would be you. Because while there are so many great shoes out there to choose from, running shoes are kind of like cars. They're all made a little differently to serve people with different needs. I've been running for over 10 years and during that time, I've not only gone through a lot of pairs of shoes, but I've also switched between types and brands of shoes as my needs have evolved. And nowadays, I rotate my shoes based on what type of run I'm going on. If any of that sounds overwhelming, don't worry. I'm actually going to break this video up into two parts because I want to take the time to explain things in a way that's easily understandable. This way, when you take a trip to your local running store, you'll feel confident and informed and can walk away feeling like you were able to advocate for yourself and your money was well spent. This first video is going to go over the anatomy of a running shoe, the typical categories of shoes when it comes to budget, cushion, and stability, and how those factors apply to different types of runners. In the second video, I'm going to talk you through how I would try on shoes at the store myself and how to take good care of the shoes once we buy them and when to replace them and do it all over again. All right, before I dive into this, I feel like I need to put up a really big disclaimer so I can establish a couple of things. As of the filming of this video, I'm not sponsored by a running shoe company as an athlete or as a coach and any products I mention or show to you in this video are just for the sake of demonstration. Yes, I'm going to use a shoe that I love and that I've been running in for years to demonstrate in this video, but I'm not being given any incentive to do so. And remember that just because I say I like a shoe doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be something you like or is even appropriate for your feet and running goals. Now that I've gotten that out of the way, let me bring out this little guy. I've got the Brooks Ghost 14 here, and this is what we call a medium cushion neutral trainer. We're gonna break down what all that means, but first, let's take a closer look at this shoe and do a super simple overview of running shoe anatomy so you can familiarize yourself with all the different parts. By the way, I'm specifically choosing this pair because I just bought them, and therefore, it's the least dirty and disgusting shoe I can put in my hands and put in front of the camera for you. All right, starting with the bottom, the bottommost layer of your shoe is called the outsole, and it's the first line of defense for your feet against the ground. Most outsoles are made of this grippy, rubbery, abrasion-resistant type material, and that's to help it protect the layers above it from scrapes, debris, and all that other stuff you don't want getting lodged into your shoe. It's also the first part of the shoe that you'll notice getting worn down over time, and if you tend to pronate or supinate, you'll notice that wear favoring one side or the other. And if you're not sure what pronate or supinate means, by the way, don't worry about it. We'll come back to that. The next layer up is called the midsole, and this is where all the action takes place. This is really what you're paying for when you buy your running shoes. And in this shoe, it's the blue uh, layer here. It's all this blue stuff. The midsole is the middle layer of the shoe, and it's essentially a foam compound with little itty bitty pockets of air inside that's able to cushion your fall like a squishy marshmallow and spring back into its original shape instantaneously. Remember, when we run, we tend to land with three to four times our body weight and force. So that foam has to be perfect to not only protect us, but continue to compress and decompress properly for hundreds of miles. If that is not a victory for science, I don't know what is, guys. The next layer up is the inner sole, and this is that thin sliver of foam right underneath our feet. In most running shoes, the insole is really just more of a liner to protect the midsole from damage, and they don't really serve any purpose other than that. I want to pause here to address a common misconception that these are also made to provide arch support, but I want to underline this point. If you're someone who needs additional arch support, most of these can actually be removed like I did here and swapped for a running specific insole or your custom orthotics. Not every runner will need one, but if you do, you aren't going to get a lot of support from this floppy thing. Okay, we've covered the bottom of the shoe, now let's talk about the top half. The whole top part of the shoe, which is mostly made up of this meshy type material, is called the upper. In the front of the shoe you have the toe box, which is where your toes sit, obviously, and in the back of the shoe you have the heel counter, which rests up against your heel. Hopefully by now you're familiar with shoelaces. I'll admit it took me a little longer than most to fully embrace them, but I've come a long way. And then of course you have the tongue, and that'll help keep those shoelaces from irritating the top of your foot. The last thing I'll mention is heel to toe drop. 
Some shoes are more flat and other shoes are more like high heels with a steeper drop from the heel to the toe box. These drops usually range from three millimeters to 12 millimeters depending on the shoe, which is actually a very small difference if you look at a measuring stick, but it can make a really big difference when you're repeatedly hitting the ground. As a rule of thumb, a higher drop means there's more cushion in the heel and promotes heel striking and a lower drop tends to promote midfoot and forefoot striking. We could take a much deeper dive into the intricacies of how the heel, the toe drop, impacts things like the load on your knees versus your ankles, or how it can affect your form, but to make your life a whole lot easier, I'm gonna suggest that you prioritize other factors first before overthinking it. If you have a preference, it'll probably feel pretty noticeable once you've put some miles into both kinds of shoes. So now that we have an understanding of the anatomy of a running shoe, let's talk through some different categories of shoes and how they factor into our decision-making process. Chances are, one thing that'll be on everyone's mind is their budget and what they're willing to pay for. Fortunately, one of the best things about this sport is that the cost of entry is pretty low compared to other sports. You don't need a membership to a club, you don't need to reserve a place to run, and you don't need a closet full of equipment. You just need one good pair of shoes unless you're a barefoot runner, in which case you just need really, really, really strong bones. And rather than going by the rule of you get what you pay for, expensive doesn't necessarily correlate with better. You could walk into the store and buy the most expensive shoes, but they could be the complete opposite of what you need to run safely and comfortably. Now let's talk about some actual numbers. Most newly manufactured running shoes will go for anywhere from $100 to $160. Some will be more, some will be less, but usually, current models of shoes will be in that range, with lower cushion shoes being on the less expensive end and higher cushion shoes being on the higher end. The big outliers are the really lightweight racing shoes that have carbon fiber plates embedded in the midsole, which are very expensive. These shoes are only meant for race day and aren't durable enough to train in, so unless you've got a lot of money to burn, you're gonna wanna be really deliberate about when you buy those kinds of shoes and when you use them. Now, if your budget is really tight and even $100 feels like a lot, have no fear. Running stores usually have huge markdowns on shoes that are about to get a new model. So if there's a shoe that you're interested in, see if they have a pair of the old model in your size or a similar shoe in an older model. Because the midsole foam in most shoes oxidizes and becomes more brittle over time, it's ideal to use a shoe within a year or two of its manufacturing. But if you can time it just right, you should be able to find a great deal on an older model before it becomes too old. The next category I wanna talk about is really the most important thing, and that's the amount of cushioning in our shoes. Like I mentioned before, running is a very high impact sport. So understanding how much cushion you're getting in your shoes is crucial for your comfort, safety, and longevity. To keep it really simple, we're gonna say there are three main levels of cushioning, light, medium, and high. The main difference between them sounds pretty self-explanatory, but what does it actually mean? Higher cushion means that your shoes will do a better job of absorbing the shock from each foot strike. And the more cushion you have in your shoe, the less your soft tissues and joints are going to experience those harmful shock waves. High cushion shoes also tend to be the most durable shoes, able to handle the most training miles. The only drawback to all that is all that cushioning tends to make the shoe heavier, so they're not as well suited for running your fastest times. They're really much better for your everyday training and long runs. On the other hand, light cushion shoes, not to be confused with minimalist shoes, by the way, which I will probably talk about in another video someday. Light cushion shoes aren't as supportive and they're not as durable as high cushion, but they're gonna be your go-to type of shoe for your speed workouts and races. This is because they have what we call better energy return, which means that the energy your legs are generating by kicking off the ground isn't being absorbed by the shoes as much, making it less tiring to run fast. Last but not least, there's the jack of all trades, medium cushion shoes like this guy right here, and these aim to give us the best of both worlds, supportive and durable, but lightweight enough that you can pick up the pace if you want. They won't be the strongest in either of those categories, but if you can only afford one shoe or only carry one pair of shoes when you're traveling, medium cushion is probably your best bet. Last but not least, let's talk about stability shoes. If you're not familiar with the concept of stability shoes, they're basically designed to allow runners who have naturally unstable ankles to run safely and comfortably. 
Nowadays, if you go into most running stores, you'll have the opportunity to have your foot strike or gait analyzed on a treadmill. If you've never done this before, it's quick, it's painless, and it should be free, so you've got nothing to lose by trying it. If I were doing your gait analysis, I'd be paying very close attention to how your foot rolls or pronates underneath your ankle as you land. And if your foot tends to roll inward just a little bit, that's perfect. That's your body's natural way of cushioning your landing. If it were totally stiff, it would be like if you jumped in the air and didn't bend your legs at all when you hit the ground. Not very good. So if you pronate just a little but not too much, you can wear what we'd call a neutral shoe like this guy. If it rolls inward too much or over pronates, you'll want to try a stability shoe in order to help control that range of motion and keep it within a safe range. There's a few ways that shoes can do this, but traditionally it's using something called a medial post, which would be a more dense piece of the midsole on the medial or inner side of the shoe to make it harder for you to roll beyond a certain amount. Uh, medial side and this is the lateral side by the way. If your foot happens to roll in the opposite direction outward, that's what we would call supination, and for that you'll either want to go with a specific type of stability shoe that uses guide rails on both sides, or you'll want to stick with a good old neutral shoe. By the way, overpronation is way more common than people think. I've done hundreds of these analyses, and I've seen it in runners of all ages and speeds. So if you've never had your gait analyzed, especially if you've ever experienced pain in that region of the ankle or the shin or the inside of the calf, I highly recommend having either a coach or an expert at your local running store take a look. And there's no shame, by the way, in needing stability shoes. A lot of runners will scratch their heads and wonder what they did wrong or what they should have done to prevent instability. Don't overthink it. It's usually just because it's the way we're built. It's the same way some of us have higher arches and longer legs than other people. And if you really want to run in a specific pair of neutral shoes and you're bummed out, don't despair. Most neutral shoes have an almost identical stability counterpart with the same amount of cushioning and for the same price. The only difference being the additional component for stability. So I think that's enough for one video. Be sure to come back for part two where we'll take this knowledge and go on a hypothetical trip to the running store and match up different kinds of runners with different needs with different kinds of shoes just to review what we went over. It'll be chock full of tips on everything from how to make sure you're wearing the right size, how to take care of your shoes once you buy them, and when it's time to lace them and replace them. Yes, I just made that up and it sounded ridiculous, but it was fun to say. As always, if you're looking for one-on-one -on -one coaching in the New York City area or virtual coaching anywhere in the US, please feel free to reach out. And if you found this video to be helpful, feel free to subscribe and follow on social media for more content. Until next time, happy running.